Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with sag After Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to watch another one of our conversations at home videos today. Um, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that we are a nonprofit organization and as such we're continuing to raise money for a COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This is working to support sag After members who are out of work with all of the film and television productions still being closed at the moment with paying bills, paying rent, paying mortgage, buying groceries, whatever it is that they need to get by financially day to day right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. Today we are so fortunate to be joined by the wonderful John Turturro, currently starring in HBO's The Plot Against America. And uh, you were just mentioning how busy, you know, you've, you've found your days on, on quarantine. And I was interested in, you know, since we're three months into this and we're kind of starting to creep back out of it in New York, we're starting to gradually open up. Like, how, how is that starting to shift things? Are you, are you already going out more spaces or are you just kind of waiting till everybody else tests the water a little bit? I've been the uh, designated uh, shopper of the family because my wife uh, had the virus uh, and uh, it, was, it was a fairly strong case of it. And uh, so I've been that person who's now she's recovered. And, uh, you know, I had, I think, a much less virulent version of it. Uh, but I've been, I go to the park, I ride my bike. Uh, take the dog for the walk, uh, walk sometimes, uh, and I go shopping and, you know, uh, but it's, I've been to, a, I've driven in once or twice into the city for, you know, to pick someone up or, or you know, or going to an emergency dentist appointment, but it's been pretty much your, in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people go to uh, Greenwood Cemetery. That's where my mom is. And uh, I noticed that people use it now as a park. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I've done a lot of, uh, it's been a lot of domestic things that, that I don't normally do. Maybe that I used to do when I had a studio apartment <laughs> by myself. Uh, so I have a, a brownstone, so it's 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 good. It's good because we have a big house, and yeah. one of my sons are is home from college. My other son lives out in Los Angeles, yeah. so uh, so there's the three of us. Yeah. yeah, that must be really nice to have the extra time. And and I feel like everyone everyone's kind of approached it differently as to to whether they're kind of like staying creatively engaged or whether they're just right. taking the time to just step back a little bit. So where where have you fallen on that spectrum? Well, I've watched uh, a lot of great movies, old, a lot of Criterion Channel movies, movies that I bought that I've never seen or people have given me. Uh, I've been reading uh, uh, Edna O'Brien, which has been a real uh, a discovery for me and uh, all her short stories. I think she's an amazing writer. And my friend Ethan Cohen, he's also reading her too. So we were like, oh, wow, you know, uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, that's been good. And I've been writing something when I have time, uh, but I, like, I've had to kind of hold down the fort in the house. Uh, uh, and uh, that's been good. That's, that's, that's been interesting. But I, I noticed that I can get waylaid sometimes from it. Uh, because I do write, uh, I've directed some movies and I've written some movies. And so I did a rewrite or something or a little revision and then I've been working on something original, which gives me a little part of the day to do something. And I did a, uh, a Zoom uh, performance of Oedipus uh, with Theater of War, which was interesting, uh, nerve wracking because of the technology and, yeah. and my internet was going in and out. Uh, How was and, that experience of doing, you know, that performance of, of Oedipus in terms of the way that you thought about the craft of performing in this specific medium? Because I think it's a new space that everyone's trying to navigate and figure out how they can use. Yeah, I mean, I did, a, I did a monologue for John Patrick Shanley, which I guess they're releasing, like 10 of us did all these different monologues. That was different, me just doing it by myself. I've done a lot of, uh, you know, charity things and, uh, 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 now they have this new app where you can you like look right into it and you, it's like you're you're reading uh it's like a teleprompter you know i I, ne I didn't use that i did for just one thing and that was really nerve-wracking because but you can you can control how fast it goes but you know the whole thing with uh, the zoom you've got to place the script somewhere that looks like you're almost looking at it i, I thought a lot of the actors did a great job. Oscar Isaac was was Oedipus, and he did a wonderful job with it. And uh, uh, 
it was it was people really you know responded to it. It was weird because you don't feel the body or whatever, but it was something. Uh, would I want to do that all the time? I I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I would. No, I I enjoy you know uh, being in a room with someone. I, I like being with people. Uh, I I really do miss that a lot uh but it was it was you know a way to reach out and it was they had these great conversations afterwards and some of the people were quite articulate there was a doctor and there was a, a social worker and an ems worker and he was amazing uh amazing to listen to but uh you know it's just been with with everything that's been going on uh uh the, the protests and everything which we're sort of right in the middle of uh uh, all you know, surrounded by helicopters and stuff. That has been, uh, uh, you know, it's been a lot to, to to take in for everybody, I guess. So it's been a, a challenging, unsettling, and hopefully a changing time for the better. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm 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 interested to see how people behave. You know, I mean, everyone behaves differently uh, depending on what age you are. You know, I have a I have a thirty year old boy, and I have well, he's going to be thirty, and one and the is going to be twenty almost. But uh, you know, when I see people, you know, you know, just without masks and without everything, it does sort of concern me a little bit. I'm thinking like I hope, you know, we don't have a big bump. Uh, but you know, we have to take it day by day. Nobody knows right now, and I'm I'm generally an optimistic person, so. Uh, uh, but I, I've certainly been reading the newspaper, you know, and other newspapers too, uh, a lot. And sometimes I need to get away from that. That's, I'm sure that you do too. So. Yes. <laughs> and to laugh once in a while, which is not, is, is really, uh, appreciated. You know, you, you realize not so easy to laugh. Yeah. yeah. Well, talking of challenging and unsettling times, I feel like that's the perfect segue into oh, talking yeah. about this show. And and I know that you were you were a huge fan of, of Philip Roth's writing to begin with, and you initially read the book when it came out in two thousand and four. Oh. And you know, I know that you kind of had some reservations about the idea of being part of a project initially that was Philip Roth because so many people have, have worked to transcribe his work into screen and, yeah. and it doesn't always work because it's so introspective and it's so much about an internal monologue and internal dialogue of the character. But what was it that you felt really secure in or really trusted so specifically either from like the scripts or, or just the way that David Simon really envisioned the show that made you believe that this was the right project and that it was going to be as successful as it ended up being in that way? Well, I think that, uh, well, I have a lot of respect for David, uh, first of all. Uh, I think that it wasn't two hours. But right there, you know, helps. Uh, the book is told from the point of view of a 10-year-old, but he's like really a 60-year-old uh, in his observations. Uh, and David didn't want to do that. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, and the book is less, to me, uh, internal than his other books are. Uh, I think with any writer, the, the joy of it is like you're getting as close to this writer as inside of another person's uh, brain and way of looking at life. And that's the exciting thing. I mean, if you, re you read Elena Ferrante, for example, you know, which I read before the, 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 the four books that, that now that HBO is, is doing, uh, you know, you're inside these two young girls, you know, uh, and I, I love that about uh, uh, writers, you know, and I've done a lot of adaptations and it's always, it's, it can be tremendously disappointing, you know, because it's hard unless you have voiceover and voiceover doesn't always work. But I thought this had a lot of action in it and interesting characters it was obviously, you know, relevant, and it wasn't as internal as his his other things. And I think I think his prose, you still miss some of his prose in his description of things. And I knew Roth, and I worked with Roth on an adaptation of one of his early books, which we never actually did. Uh, but uh, that was a really interesting experience, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of his. And this is. Mm, a very different kind of book 
you know, for him. Uh, and I'm a big history buff. I love reading about history because I think it really, you know, informs us. I mean, right now, if you've read certain books, you understand the situation, you know, better. And uh, I thought, I, I just thought, uh, you know, obviously it's the Jewish group that they're talking about, but that's a metaphor too. I mean, it's a reality, it's an actuality, but also it could be another group. Uh, and a lot of these things were taken from the time. And in order to understand the 30s, you have to understand, like, you know, from 1890 on, you know, and what was the mentality going on then uh, and how people were, you know, demonized and stuff and people wanted to be, you know, accepted. So I thought it had a lot of relevance for me. I've, I've worked on, a, I worked for many years. I did an adaptation of a Primo Levi book. They were, they were friends, Roth and Levy. And he said that had a huge effect on my life. And I think he drew certainly the character that I played from a, well, I think from Levy uh, in some ways. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I just thought would, I'd be in good company. So it was, uh, it was challenging and, uh, and I'm really, I'm happy that I, you know, participated in it. Yeah. I mean, same, just watching it. Glad that you, <laughs> you came to that conclusion. And, and I know as part of your preparation and research process that you actually went down to Charleston and South Carolina yeah, and, and spent some time down there. And, and I was just interested in the way in which that was a really useful tool, you know, from, from the dialect in to the way that you really understood your character and, and his backstory and his history and, and how wow. that changed the way that you played him on screen in those ways. Well, Charleston, South Carolina is a fascinating place because it was a port city. And a lot of people who didn't come in through, uh, you know, New York or came to New York and then went down south, came in, you know, from a different uh, route. You know, uh, they, were, they, were, they were coming in from the, you know, from the islands, you know, to uh, South Carolina. And it has one of the oldest Jewish communities. Uh, they were Sephardic uh, uh, originally, and then they were Ashkenazi that came later. Uh, and I just, I, you know, I met all these people uh, from that community and other people. And I, for me, if I could do that for like, you know, three months or something like that, uh, to me, that's almost as interesting as doing a job. I have to be honest, uh, because you know, you, you're learning all these things. And, you know, my wife is uh, Jewish and she couldn't believe, the, you know, the people fought for the Confederacy, that, that they had slaves, you know. I mean, the original people who were in the Ku Klux Klan, you know, it was not, later on it became anti-Semitic, but originally it wasn't, it was, it was anti-Black uh, because, you know, it was during Reconstruction. Uh, and so, you know, there's all this history down there of that too. And that there was the guy who was second to uh, Jefferson Davis. Uh, 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 you, uh, he, you know, was uh, Judah Benjamin. You know, he was Jewish. He was the secretary of state. Uh, he was the second powers, powerful most man in the Confederacy. So when you take that kind of history, it's so interesting. Uh, and fascinating. And so I, uh, and then I, you know, I thought about a lot of different people that I think Roth was drawing on. There's a guy that Primo Levi writes about who was the, the head of the Loge ghetto, uh, uh, Heim Romkowski, and uh, who sort of collaborated, you know, with the Nazis to try to save people. Maybe he was misguided. Uh, and it is where he's a really complex character. And uh, I've always been interested in that story. And I thought this character, uh, 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 Bengelsdorf, uh, I thought had some similarities to that. But I just, I love to meet people from different backgrounds. And, uh, and then there was the accent. And I, I worked with Tim Monarch, who also helped me a lot with that. But it was, it's just great to, to learn things. Uh, and to be exposed to different things. And I mean, one great thing about being an actor is that you understand different points of view, even if you don't agree with them. Even, and I think it, it helps uh, 
you know, you have to have a certain amount of empathy, even for things that you say, wow, I wouldn't, I don't think I would do this, you know, but uh, uh, there are lots of people who think they can negotiate uh, something that when there's extremity comes and they wind up sometimes being on the wrong side of history. You know, so yeah. I, I thought that was interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a history nut, so I, 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 I dig that stuff, you know. I, I, I find it shocking, the things that you learn. And you go like, I never knew that, you know. And, uh, you know, so it was, it, was, it was useful. Yeah. Were there things that you did in order to kind of take a deeper dive into his, his work as a rabbi? Because, I, it, you know, it feels like it influences his relationships with all of the characters around him, particularly with Winona Ryder's character, Evelyn. Um, but also, you know, if you think about the care that he has for his community, the way that he really is always trying to look out for other people and do good. And, and it really says a lot about how he ends up on this path, because, you know, I think he, you're the one that's, that's very much described him as someone who is he's misguided. He's not trying to be in the wrong place of history. No, he thinks he's he's he thinks he's he's protecting everyone, you know, because yeah. he's saying we're at risk and we want to sh- you know we want to be able to be included in that situation. And I think uh, many groups have suffered uh, from that, and there have been religious leaders who've done that. Um, and then you get closer to power, and you you, you want to be able to have a big effect or a bigger effect. You know, and, you know, he quotes all the different, you know, uh, uh, great, you know, Jewish figures, you know, he, he, he's able to drop it at a, at a hat and, you know, to use that. He's a really erudite guy. And I think he, that's part of his uh, attraction to, to Evelyn and, and to, the, to the little boy, Sandy, because he's, he represents something different. Uh, but, you know, he thinks he can see the good in people, you know, and, uh, and lots of people tried to negotiate, you know, and they said, okay, well, I think we can, we can talk to this person. I mean, you know, 80% of our country before World War II was isolationist because of World War One. Also, there was strong German population. There was, there was a Nazi party in this country. And uh, so, it's complicated. It's it's complicated, and when and you can once you take some missteps, you know you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then a lot of times these people wind up at the end realizing, wow, I'm just as I'm I'm even more at risk than everyone else, you know. And uh, you know you once you compromise, there are certain things maybe you should negotiate and there's certain things you shouldn't, you know? And I think it, it's, it's easy in retrospect to judge what happened, but you don't know what you would have done to, you know what I'm saying? So it's, uh, I, I think you learn a lot from that because everyone imagines they would always be on, you know, the right side of things. And it's, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up, there were plenty of people I know who wouldn't buy a Ford car, you know, because of Henry Ford, you know. Uh, uh, so a lot of these things get kind of whitewashed later on, you know. So, uh, uh, anyway. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you a little bit as well in terms of, of the way that the show was filmed, because you were filming it mostly on, on a soundstage, I think, in Long Island, um, and how that's a really conducive tool to be in an environment where you can really control it, particularly for a period piece. Because, you know, I imagine that, particularly in a period piece, that all of the exterior elements to, to your performance, from the costumes to the road that you're walking down, what the houses look like, and, and all the props are, are even more important than they would be regularly to you. I think the clothes are, that's very important. I've done a lot of, a lot of period things, you know, every little, everything. It's like, you know, my mother used to make wedding dresses and I used to help her cut the patterns out. Sometimes I even, when I was really, really skinny and tall, even, yeah. And, and she was doing it for a tall lady. I sometimes, 
you know, modeled those dresses for her because the, her, her dummy was too short. But, you know, the painstaking detail that she used to do when she used to have to beat it, that's what it's all about. It's all about all these little details and then how you work with the other people. But we, we had a lot of locations, too. The synagogue was real. Uh, uh, there were certain, you know, halls and, and places that we shot in that were... I, I like shooting in real locations. Sometimes it's great. In a, I mean, their house was a stage, so that, that was a stage. But most of my locations were real, uh, except for Madison Square Garden, obviously. Uh, and it was, I mean, I loved working with, you know, with, with Zoe and Morgan and the kids. And, uh, and Winona, we just kind of, you know, it was, it was easy. To, to work together and she's such a lefty and she was like wow I don't know if I can do this and I was like well you know you've got to believe in what you're doing you know and uh, I, I, that's why Roth wrote it it's not like these people that you know are so rare they're more more common than we think you know and uh, you know it's I mean, we're in a situation like now in our country where we're, where we're seeing a lot of these things. I mean, the whole expression of American first. But, you know, a lot of that stuff came out of eugenics. And people don't realize that, of saying the certain, there was a certain kind of people that was superior to other people, whether they be black, whether they be Jewish, whether they be Italian, Polish. And a lot of these books were written, uh, believe it or not, in this country. Uh, there's a book called The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant, who uh, I think he is, he's the, uh, one of the creators of the Museum of Natural History. Uh, and that book, there, were, there was a French book, there was an English book, but there were a bunch of these books that were written. Uh, and uh, one of the guys, not Madison Grant, had a big debate with W.B. Uh, the boy, uh, 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 about race. Uh, and they influenced the National Socialist in Germany. And one of Hitler's favorite books was The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant. And it was used, some of these books, as a defense during the Nuremberg trials. And a lot of these books were written here about the superiority of uh, the Nordic races. You know, and anything that was kind of great, even things that came from Italy, they said it came from the Nordic, you know, uh, superiority of the, the head and the brain. And I mean, it goes, so this was a science, a junk science that was studied in Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and all these schools for years until it was exposed for, for what it was. And that helped close the immigration gates, not in 1880, but in 1924 against the uh, Jews, Italians, and Poles. They, they closed the gates completely. And so it's all, you know, uh, 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 it's all connected, you know, and, uh, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, if they thought that, then they would never, you know, all this stuff that happened after Reconstruction, they were going to, you know, keep the, 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 the black community, you know, as quashed and uh, squashed as, as, as possible. So this is a big part of our, our, our country. And that American first thing comes actually right out of the eugenics uh, thing. And it's, uh, there's a great book called uh, The Guarded Gate that came out about it. And that was, uh, I mean, I read all these books. So <laughs> I could go on and on. But it's all connected to what happened before. So I'm saying, so if you think of a guy who wants to be uh, assimilated and accepted. That's a big thing, no matter what we, especially when you're educated, mm -hmm. you know, and, you, and you, that you have an entree into the corridors of power. Uh, it's, uh, it can be uh, tempting. You yeah. Know, it can be tempting, you know, so, uh, uh, but it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's so that was, that's my job to do all of those things. But uh, that helps me understand where people are, you know, uh, coming from. 
Yeah, and it's so fascinating to watch the journey that this this character ends up in and how he ends up drawn in further and further. And, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about filming um, the scene where he's giving the speech. I think it's in episode two. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just the way that you collaborated with Mickey Spiro, who's the director on that, because I, I read that one of the things that you actually wanted for that scene, because obviously, you know, you couldn't have the space filled with loads of background actors. And, and I think particularly for you as well, having worked so extensively in, in theater and knowing what that, that real energy feels like when you're feeding off of it in a room, kind of why it was important for the two of you to, to collaborate on, on what that would look like, but also what that felt like in the room and, and that choice to, to have people in the room kind of responding and, yeah. What you were saying to help with the rhythm and the flow of it as well. Yeah, I, I gave her certain moments that I thought yeah. would be good if they could give me some response here or there, or if she, they, she wanted me to, to be surprised. But we had to kind of do it in a way that would match each time. I mean, I know what it is to handle the crowd. I've performed in small theaters and big theaters, and it, it changes your performance. I mean, many years ago, before I played Primo Levi in The Truce, you know, uh, I did uh, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Uy, which I played basically Hitler. You know, I studied it for a year. I studied, I mean, he's a gangster in Chicago, but it's based all on Hitler. And, you know, uh, people were really scared when I did it. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and that was written actually during, you know, uh, the war. But I, I remember doing those speeches with a real audience, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, so that was that was a challenge, you know, to do that. But I thought, okay, if it's twenty thousand people, you got to reach out to twenty thousand people, and uh, and it's kind of a scary thing. I originally, it was supposed to be on the radio, and I told David, I said, listen, if you want me to do the part, I have to be able to, you know, you have to be able to see that uh, at least a portion of that speech, you know, and uh, and how far he goes, yeah. you know, with that. Uh, so. You know, I think the whole idea is when you do stuff like that is to maybe actually grab the audience for a moment and say, yeah, I kind of agree with that guy, you know, and then you go, oh, you know, that's the idea is to to make them say, what about you? What do you, what's inside of you that would agree with this? And that's the interesting thing when you do complex, you know, uh, you know, characters or whatever. That's the joy of it, actually, to say, oh, wow, you know, for the grace of God, that could be me. I, mean, I could do that. You know, I could be in that situation, you know. Uh, even if, you know, it's, you want to implicate, implicate the viewer in some way. And in order to do that, you can't make someone into a monster. You have to make them into something that's they can identify with. Yeah, and one of the interesting things in, in the way that I think you show how he kind of subsequently then pulls other people into his belief system and, and his space, it's just the way that you talk and think about the pacing and the rhythm. And there's there's such kind of like a cautious thoughtfulness to the way that he delivers every word and every sentence. And it really kind of pulls people closer to him. So right. it's interested in the way that you thought about that in terms of, you know, when he's giving speeches, like in that moment, but also the way that he talks to people on a personal level when it's when it's one-on-one -on -one as well. In that well, way. he speaks in paragraphs and Roth is really you know he said they had never heard sentences like that in their house yeah. and so when you you know it can be really uh, alluring and seductive you know and uh, you know I mean, uh, it's you know that it's a it, it, that way of thinking you know and, and being able to articulate it, you know and when you when you hear someone sometimes who speaks in paragraphs you're really you can go, wow, man, they didn't even write that down, you know, and uh, it's kind of a gift, you know. Uh, I mean, there's people on the radio that I listen to, and maybe it's, they don't speak in paragraphs, but it's just the tone of their voice and how they draw you in. Brian Lair, when I listen to Brian Lair, I'm like, I trust Brian Lair, you know, I, I, I rely on him, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, you have this whole relationship with them. Terry Gross, for years. I, I mean, I've even done interviews with Terry Gross, but, you know, I have a relationship with her voice. So the voice, I think, in many ways, is superior, uh, the ear is superior to the eye. Because when we hear a big, like, whistle, we can imagine a whole train station. Where the eye is, what you see is what you get. 
you know, unless it's an amazing composition, like, you know, something in Bergman or something. Uh, so I think the ear is, is something wonderful about it. You know, a lot of old movies sometimes, someone who has all the dialogue, it's on their back and it's on your face and I'm doing all the talking. And, uh, but you can hear it. So it's, uh, it's interesting. So, yeah, know. it's, it's so fascinating the way that that all works. And yeah, I mean, it's, that's what you, that's what you're attempting to do. Whether you succeed or not, you, you don't know. I would listen back to it and say, well, that sounds okay. And, you know, this and that. And, you know, it's, oh, I absolutely think you succeed with that yeah, in, in the uh, show. And yeah. and actually, one of the things that I, I loved was Morgan Spector talking about how, for him, part of the experience of working on the show was, was the opportunity and the way that he had the chance to learn from from you and the way that you were on set, the way that you carried yourself and just watching you as a performer. And I was curious for, for you at this point in your career, you know, you've got... An what did he say exactly? What did he say exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to find the verbatim quote, but essentially, oh, yeah. he was like, you were part of, you know, the positive experience for him and getting to watch you and getting very to nice. watch you. Yeah, and, very... and, you know, given the amount of, of variety in the roles that you've taken on, the types of projects that you've done, and, you know, even just on screen, you've done over 100 projects at this point. Do you still find yourself looking at the cast around you and, and kind absolutely. of paying attention to what they're absolutely. doing? And up absolutely, from? absolutely. I, I mean, I'm talking to you. So, you know, you're the the other person in the conversation that's it it's so you you're taking everything in and l being a good listener is maybe just as important if not more important uh and it's hard when you're repeating it over and over and over again uh you know uh so yes i don't feel like i know more than other people do i bring in my own you know, whatever nerves you have, or whatever trepidations you have of the big scene, if you have all these big speeches, you know, it's, you have to do it on the day. It has to live and be alive and you have to be communicative with your partners. So I don't, I, you can learn from a little kid, you know, you can learn from anybody. And there are people I've, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't shut that off. Uh, uh, there are people, you know, obviously that I've, really admired and I've gotten to work with who are older than me and you know watched how how they you know approach things or concentrated uh and you know those have been more you know maybe my influences uh uh but uh, I, I I've learned a lot of different things from working from with different directors and how to relax myself what I what I like you know, sometimes to do it without cutting, do it again, do a couple in a row. Sometimes putting on a piece of music when I don't have to talk, if I have to be, a you know, there are little, little things or asking your partner to do something extra off camera for you or you do that for them. Uh, and I, I think working off camera is really important because you can help make another person's uh, performance, which will then make your performance, you know, it's... I think you really have to, you know, if you're a people person, if you like people, you want everybody to, to work together. You know what I mean? We're all in it together. Whatever it is, a love scene, a fight scene, this scene. So, uh, so no, I don't, I don't say, okay, I'm the older person here and I know. No, that would be, uh, but that's nice that they thought I, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that was a good influence. Uh, and I think, yeah. And I think it's a good, a good influence is sometimes someone, you know, to question something when it's not right or, or you know, but, uh, you know, we're working within the confines of limitations, you know, of how much time we have, you know, what's the blocking, you know, uh, certain things I like to be able to be involved in the blocking. And when I'm blocked before, you know, if it works, great, you know, but uh, the how I do something is important to me. Like, you know, I had one scene where I didn't want to just be sitting and talking, so I was making a flower arrangement, you know, and when Zoe comes over and I thought, uh, I've worked in a flower shop for another movie and I, I just, you know, all the ladies taught me how to make, you know, I, I just loved working in this flower shop. I could have stayed there forever. Uh, uh, Florabella, the, the shop is. Uh, and so it, it helped. I had, I had an activity, 
So uh, I didn't have to put all my attention on Zoe. And so Zoe had to, you know, had more of an obstacle I often, which I think maybe served the scene, hopefully. Yeah. Well, if the acting doesn't work out, at least you know you can go work in a, in a flower shop again. There's a lot of things I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> flower shop, uh, you know, baker, you know, all kinds of things. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for talking about the show and your work on it. It's been, been really wonderful to hear more about your process and, and just the experience of making it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I wish everybody good health. All right. Thank you. Take care. Great. Right, bye-bye.